Good morning. Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I'm, I'm all wired. So, right. <laughs> Those who don't know me, say Peter Sanders, Sanders Sales. Um, I just want to start with the backdrop here, only because it just happens to be uh, the first Contessa 32 ever built, Contessa Catherine in the back, and the front here is actually Calypso, which was, well, they've, they've done a couple since then, but it's almost like the first and the, and the, and the, and the most recent. Two different cell plans. Original one there still got the original cell plan. That cell plan is still dating back to 1970. And the class rules, although they actually uh, sort of changed, sort of, um, I suppose, ref refined them a bit, but the actual outside sizes of those cells are still exactly the same now as it was back when Davis had the first design of the boat. Interestingly enough, now this is, this is a carbon membrane cell here. I'll talk more about that a bit later on Calypso, which they had, had built for the Round the Island race. If you're rating, if you're, sorry, if you're racing under IRC, the old Contessa would have to give the new Contessa time. Even though it's got a carbon fiber sale, you know, the old one, and, and, and quite a lot of time. On Calypso, it's got a furling system and a slightly smaller head saw. Therefore, the ratings would be quite a lot less. And therefore, poor old Contessa here going around the island would probably have to do it probably about 10, 15 minutes quicker than the, the new one. I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> now, that's me back in 1974. Beside me, John Carriage in the centre, and, and uh, Mervyn Cook is his brother in law. That's how I started International Moths. That was my thing back then. Um, we were designing sales there, Steve Luff, Camera induced moth sales in 1974, which the other DD classes haven't caught up with until you know, very, very recently. Um, so that's how I got and the cup I'm holding. Actually, I'd love to say I won that myself, but John actually won that. That's the International Moth European Championship. And that's how I sort of got into it. And so that's 1974, started signing the sales. And of course, at that time, Jeremy looked like that. <laughs> he still does look like that. And he still does look like that. A little bit whiter. Uh, oh no, Fiona. <laughs> I've got to jump the next two slides now. Pop me in a bikini. <laughs> Not if you'll know this, but Fiona was the original playgirl. <laughs> I have pitched the pill with Hugh Hefner. <laughs> but what, what, what I was going to say is that so this, is, this is when my first started signing myself, 1974. Jeremy got that at. And, you know, it's always been very quiet, you know, Jeremy. It's still quiet back in those days, but fairly imposing to a young guy only 19 years old. <coughs> trying to sell sales onto obviously the 26 and the bottom there, but the 32 they just started to build. So of course I had to change, so I grew them a start. <laughs> now, now this time, this is, well, I'm now I'm probably about 21 years old then, and uh, I grew that because obviously it's very hard to sell sales to owners of classic yachts like the Contessa when you look too young. And at uh, this time also, I'm, I'm standing in the Royal for Yacht Club now, which is very nice. Back then, I was not allowed in here. They didn't, they didn't allow trade. <laughs> so, so I was, you know, sometimes I got sneaked in here by members for a drink after an ex-boat race or something, but, but then there's always someone muttering in the corner and tutting away. So, so it was actually quite a lot longer until I was allowed in here. Right. Let's talk about sales. Now, I, never talk, I was told the majority of you people here are cruising, um, so I'll talk more about sort of making the actual uh, cruising boat, cruising sails. And also I'll talk more about the racing sales at the end as well. A bit of a sort of interaction, just out of interest, see what's around. Now what I've done here, the picture here is a pretty bad photograph now, which I'm blaming on the Mac, <laughs> <laughs> um, as opposed to the PC. So that's, but yeah, that, that actually there is, is obviously Calypso uh, 939, um, was taken just after. With, on that on Calypso, we actually refined the sails on that to try and make a sail, a boat, that actually had the easiest to handle sails for a family. So I'm looking down here and look all the different items I'll discuss now. Jumping on the mainsail first. Now, on Calypso, it has a fully battered mainsail. With the new cell the mast sections, this is very easy because there's a, a, a void in the back of the mast for the cars to fit into. This is not available on the older mast sections. Now, this picture here is a, a mast section, very typical of the original Contessas. They all had road reefing booms. They had the bolt rope track on the back of the mast made it impossible to A, fit slides, let alone a fully battened sail. Is anyone here who's got one of these tracks still? Ah, did right. have. Did have. Ah, right. And how's, 
<laughs> yes, and if you take it off, you can access the groove for slides. But if you want to have fully battened, you can't put a decent fully battened car into the track underneath it. So there is a way around that, and that's what's called the Tides Marine Track. Now, we ah, you got on yours, then? Right? Yes, you have, yes. yes you have. Ripple. Sorry, sir, yes. Ripple. This is a great way of converting an old mast to take a fully battened mainsail quite cost effectively. It's a one piece plastic track, it slides into the existing groove, and the actual cars we on the sail stings the other plastic, and it's fantastic to use the handling. I mention that because I think Jeremy's already converted two or three to the Tides Marine track we supplied there. And if you're doing it with a mask down, you can just slot the track in from the top, it's easily done. There's, I'm not suggesting that Gigi actually has um, got a, a tide wing track on there, but this is actually Gigi. Was that actually 2010 or 2011, Fiona? 28. 28? God, I'm even older than I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> so, 28. So, um, <coughs> that sail plan there is exactly the same as if we actually take a photograph of the boat back in 1971, 72, the size of the sails would be exactly the same then as it is there. This. It's a nice little boys' outing, really. <laughs> now, when I first came into the yacht club here, the Jonathan Bradbury there on Main Street, you know, he was saying with Morning Cloud, I think, back in those days. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, he's got, he's, got his, he's got his brother there on the rail there, a bit of extra weight. <laughs> 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 but but the, well, the reason I should point that here, because I thought, as I showed you photographs and talk about the sail plans, sails designed for Eclipse, etc., I just mm -hmm. mentioned a few things on the sail systems. I'll let Stan, obviously, half and go into what pitch you should have, but just showing here. The important things when setting up a mainsail, you've got the kicking strap, I've got a little right up here, kicking strap here set up on the centre line. When you're on the wind, it's important you don't over tension that. The only thing that set that does for the Contessa 32 when you're on the wind is actually stop the boom from bumping up and down. So the only tension on that, just have enough to stop the boom from jumping. The main sheet will actually provide the angle to the wind of the leach of the sail. So the main sheet here. That actually is going to tension the leech of the sail. That's going to get your telltale flying correctly. The kicker, whilst the boom is inside the boat, just have enough tension to stop the boom from jumping. And unless it's really windy, then you might need to give us some assistance on the kicker to actually, with, with the main sheet, just to hold the boom down. But I've seen often people start whacking on the kicker there unnecessarily. Because there's a traveller, which is hidden down inside the cockpit here, because the traveller's in there, so you, you can actually get good tension on the main sheet without the use of the kicker. The kicker, though, as soon as this boom goes outside of the cockpit, the kicker then comes onto its own. So that's when it's necessary to have the kicking strap. So how much kicking strap? Well, as soon as you actually take the boom with outside, the, main, the kicking strap now becomes the main sheet. The main sheet now becomes the traveller. So you need enough kicking strap tension to do the same job as the main sheet was doing before, which is try and keep the top batten parallel with the boom and no more. Because when you're going downwind, you don't want to turn the sail back. You're not trying to sort of turn the sail to create a bag. You're just trying to project area. Just keep enough tension on the leash of the sail to try and keep the top batting parallel. Telltales. And what I'm doing here, when I looked at my talk before, and I've done three talks already in the last four weeks, it, was, it would take a good couple of hours. So I've actually sort of compressed everything into this half hour I've been given. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I'd rather than doing everything set, I'd sort of put everything together. And so I'd have mentioned there before with Jeremy there about the telltales in the back of the sail. This actually shows the telltales on the leash of the mainsail. It is Preferable if you can get all telltales streaming together. The chances are you won't get the telltale at the top streaming. You can have that one breaking, probably, even if it breaks half of the time, it's okay. The important thing, keep the bottom three going and try and keep the top one done streaming. In heavy airs, you can get that streaming quite easily. In light airs, because of the wind gradient difference, now what, the reason why there's twist on any sail is the wind gradient difference between the water's surface and the air at the top of the mast and therefore the friction of the air with the water will slow the air down, and therefore you'll have to, you, you can go closer to the wind down here than you can at the top. The wind is going faster up here. And therefore, you need to twist the leaf of the sail, and therefore the telltales are showing you the exit of the air off the sail, <coughs> and therefore try and get more streaming altogether. But you'll find the top one will break, and you just keep it on the brake for most of the time, then that's perfect. If you find the top one streaming, and the middle ones are breaking, that suggests that the sail is too full in the centre. If the sail is too full in the centre there, then you need to increase mass bend to flatten the sail out. Any questions? <laughs> this, this is the, the, the wisdom version. She's gone now, I can talk about her. <laughs> She's still there. <laughs> <about her. laughs> <laughs> Janelle, now, 
Any questions on main source? Fully battered main source? Single line reefer main source? No? no? Good. <laughs> sure, so on Calypso, now the Contessa 32 originally, as it was built under the IOR rule, had 150% Genoa. And that under the old IOR uh, rule, that was the biggest sales sale you can have, and everyone designed sales, the sales, sales, sales plans to suit that rule. And so they're very big Genoas, very small main source, very typical of the year. When you go to a fitter furling system, there's no need to go for that size of sail. The fact is they'll be too big and you have to start reducing its size too soon. Up till recently, we, re we recommended 140% sail, but on Calypso, we actually reduced it down again to 135%, which is about the same size as number two Genoa. And the reason we've done that is to try and make sure that the sail is fully out for the majority of the time. As soon as you start rolling up a furling Genoa, then it all goes to rats. You know, it would be fine for the first few re revolutions, but it's not going to last well that long. It, it just, I'm afraid the, the actual geometrics of it make it impossible to be perfect. And so the more you can keep that genera fully out, the better. And on a Contessa 32 with a small mainsail, I'd even say, you know, put, even put two reefs soon before furling the genera because it's, you get much more better performance. Because the, the genera, he wears the trousers. Now he's in charge. The, the mainsail is just the trim tab. The genera is actually creating the power, creating your pointing. So whatever you do, you know, genera is, is, is the one you should concentrate on. On this sail here, I, there's a couple of things that I just to mention here. This little line here, and we put that in all of our furling genomas. So it's, it's got a trim line in the clue of the sail. And the idea of this trim line is you match up the genoa sheet with that trim line so the sheet goes onto the car in line with that line. Now, this is a guide. I said it's a guide because it, getting the position of that genoa car in the right place is, it, uh, is, is finite and it's important to get it correct. But this is a good starting point. So when you first get a sail from us, pull a sail out. Extend the genoa sheet down that line, put your genoa car there, start there. Now, to find out where the car should go exactly, then you need these little fellows here, the telltales. Now, as you'd expect with, with Jeremy Helming, these telltales are streaming perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and the way you find out where your genoa car should go is go on the wind and go up to wind. As you go up to wind, all these telltales should lift together. If they don't, if the top starts lifting first, which is normally what will happen, it suggests that the sail on the top there is fuller than the bottom, and therefore you need to flatten the top off to actually get them all to lift together. So you just move the car and you juggle this around until you get them all lifting together, and that is the correct position. <coughs> As the wind increases, because I just told you to try and leave this genera out all the time, just move the car back one. The top telltale will start lifting again, but ignore it. Just drive off the bottom part of the sail. It's far better to have a full size this size of sail fully out, driving off the bottom in too much wind, then to start rolling the sail up. Okay? Oh, and also along here, there's a little, little mark there, you just see it hidden between the stanchions. We also put foot markers on the sail as well. So when you get the sail, it's a good, this piston here, despite um, what people think, isn't clever, isn't actually designed to be a number two genera, a number three genera, or Pacific area, or percentage area. It just gives you a point of reference. So when you roll up to that marker, you can then move your car using the trim guide to where it should go for that marker, and in the future, you always know where that car is to suit that position. So it saves a lot of time in the future rather than putting a rolling up to nowhere, then having to move the car forward, and then having to go up to where all the time to get the, the telltales correct. Okay, any questions? No. Do, do, you put oh. stuff, do you put stuffers in your... Um, stuffers? Yeah. Um, um, <coughs> um, phone yeah. Yes, we do, yes. Yeah, we actually phone up. We actually do um, either phone up or the double rope. We stopped in the double rope now, funny enough. We, we tried to do it more because this has got a phone up padding in the front. It shouldn't be too thick. Um, the phone up padding is better if it's a fillet shaped, and so we only use like a five mil foam, and probably have it coming about six inches into the sail, and it should be tapered so the widest part of that foam is where the biggest cord of the sail is. Okay. The actual you can put a rope in there. I know that North put a rope in there all the time because they're made in Sri Lanka, and I think that's how they, whether it's size or probably from the tree, but, 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 it's, <laughs> but, it's, but it's quite, it's quite, you don't know, look at the geometrics of it, the rope is quite a clever idea, because the whole idea is to try and increase the diameter of the foil. Therefore, if you actually put a revolution of the foil with a rope behind it, therefore, where the rope is, it's going to have a much bigger diameter, therefore, it's going to flatten the sail as it rolls up. What we found is that the, because you had to stop and start the rope or taper the rope, um, they actually sort of intertwine them all. It looks very ugly when it's in there. So we, we actually prefer to use the foam as being a neater way of doing it. But the foam, make of the foam is critical because it's got to be non-cellular, non like a closed cell foam. Otherwise, it will retain moisture. And it retains moisture, it's going to grow bulgy. 
and that will be held inside the sleeve. And we've seen a lot of people use like the parcel phones, the cheap phones now. And it, it does, it, it looks, after a while you get the whole thing up there, it's just covered in mildew. This last year actually has been the worst year ever for, for algae and mildew um, on, on sales and covers. It's, it's been such a, a damp year, but I don't tell you that, do I? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on the genome? Oh, Guy. Yeah, Peter, two questions, if mm. I may. Just going back to car positions, mm. I've always been taught, and possibly quite wrongly, that the lured side of the sail uh, is much less stable in terms of flow, and therefore if you bear away rather than head up, the top telltales can be much more responsive than coming up into the wind. Is that right or rubbish? I've, I've never heard that before. <laughs> rubbish. <It's> rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> 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 it is, I mean, the, the lured side is... Yes, if you can see the lure telltale through the sail, yeah. then, then that, that system will work. But well, what I do on Cassante is I <laughs> sit in the full pit, and I look at the lured one, not the weather one. Okay. Well, there's another way of doing it. You can actually have a very large tiller extension. Go to the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, I can see it. it will work that way. You can there see is somebody else on the hill. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He sends the butler up on the hill. Oh, oh, yes. I'm oh, sorry, I follow this guy. Yes. <laughs> My second question yeah. is, you've mentioned that as you start to fail, of course, you're in the geometry. Mm. Now, Unless I'm much mistaken, you're making a sale at the moment which is less exotic than some of the other racing fellows, which is designed um, to fell up and still be a decent sale. The, well, the, the, the sales will, on the exotic sales, which I'm sure you later, you can take them to a Pacific mark. Right. When you actually make an exotic sale, like the membrane sales, you have to put yarn in to that position. And therefore, you can't have a variable position. You only put one, maybe two there. If you put those repositions in, the, the yarns are laid up to them. A, you increase the weight of the sail because you're putting the yarns in there, and you only have that one specific point to get to. When you roll it up, it is still, it's going to be okay. Um, and if you have to go down, go down to that, but it's never going to be as good as a sail that's got the entry angle as small as a, as, as a, as a foil size. Now, and I wouldn't, it, obviously, it's important that you actually get rid of drag. You know, dr drag is created by heating force. Heating force is created by too much sail up, up. So certainly getting rid of head at some point is going to be necessary. But I would have said that you have to leave that you know, to the last minute. I know on, on Calypso, for enough, when they had that uh, carbon sail earlier, they started off around the island race you know, two or three years ago with pearls in the, in the carbon sail and made them. And big mistake. You know, they realized soon, they, even as they windy it there, they actually, in the end, they took the whole sail out, dropped the mainsail, put the reef in the mainsail, and the boat handled it really well. Especially when there's new fabrics coming up, is the exotic fabrics. As soon as you start using carbon and Kevlar, the modulus of that fabric is so much better than Dacron. There is no crimp in it due to the weaving. And if you actually take one piece of carbon or Kevlar, or say, say Kevlar, it's going to take 10 times the load to actually stretch it by a given amount, say 1%. It takes 10 times as much weight to actually stretch it. So you can see, if you're comparing that, so in a non exotic exotic sail with increased wind, it's going, to get, it's going to stretch, get deeper. So you need to roll it up on an exotic sail. You won't. You actually, as long as you have the sail controls on, on the boat to keep things flat, you can have that full sail out an awful lot longer. Yeah. Any questions? No? Jumping on. Sheet league. I just discovered, just discussed that now from the, the bigger picture, so I'll jump over that quickly. Jenica. Now, this is something that the Contessa 32s historically have never had. The, in the old days, we had Jenicas which actually were on piston hanks because they, you know, Back in the good old 70s, there was no furling systems then. You had piston hanks on your head saws. When you brought Contessa 32, it came with a number one and number two, what they called a staysail and a storm jib. And that was the standard inventory. And that was great for us sailmakers. Um, and we had, we had the option of adding on a Jenica as well, which is a very light wind nylon sail, which could hang onto the forestay and um, give you a, a good light weather sail um, and a reaching sail. With the um, introduction of furling systems, the contestant's got a very sort of pretty bow on it. You don't want to sort of mess it up with bow spritz. And there's always been a problem trying to find a way of actually furling a Jenica. This actually is on um, Persephone, um, another brand new contest that Jeremy's actually recently built. We have to Scotland. This, this, is, this has got, actually, there, this, is, this is being sailed single-handed up in Scotland uh, by the owner. And this has got the full, fully battened mainsail here with the MDS cars. 
It's got the stack pack sail cover, which is great for, for sail handling with a fully battered mainsail. The roller of the here rolled up, and this furling gen cap. Now let's jump across here. This is how hideous a contester would look if you tried, because up to now, <coughs> this is the only way. With the furling system, you have to get that furling system away from the bow. And to get it away from the bow, you have to put a bowsman on there or a strut or some way of keeping it away. And the contestant has got a lovely sharp bow, and if it's got the, the pulpit, does go forwards. And so there's no way you could really actually put a drum in there. So, watch. This is what uh, Jeremy did on Persephone. We, so, very clever idea. We needed the gate shore that had a very strong point down to the stem head. And so, just by having a. Here it's just sort of tied on temporarily, but there is actually now got a stainless rod there, or like a chain plate, holding the bottom of the drum. It's important that there is a chain plate actually at this point here that can't turn, because if you start rolling the sail up, you've got an anti torsion rope inside it. You roll it up, and of course, you let go of the rope, the whole thing's going to shivel up again, and it's going to twist the rope underneath the drum into what Sam would call a bunch <coughs> of buggers. <laughs> Te technical term. So, so this is very, so now, now the, the reason I'm sort of pointing out the genica here is that we've already made a genera now that's 135%, so it's slightly smaller than the standard. Therefore, in light airs, the boat's going to be a little bit sticky. Also, when you're reaching, when you're cracked off, you know, all of the contestants are fantastic women with the boat. As soon as you cracked off a bit, you're footing, the actual boat's really quick. You'll miss that with a smaller head saw. By using the genica, you can have a sail that's 160%, that's very easy to handle, that will furl up on its inner stay, and the depth will drum, you can leave the drum there, and just disconnect the sail from the drum if you like. In the case of Persephone, the owner there has two genicas. He has this one here, which is made, you can see, the, just to tell the fabric here, is actually what's called a cone zero laminate. So it's very lightweight laminate fabric, very low stretch, so it's very good for close winded sailing. And he has a, another genica, which is made of nylon, which he uses for more off the wind. With these, sail, these systems here with the rope inside the luff, um, the sails can't sail that deep. You can ease them off and the sail will come round a bit, but the fact is you're, you're sailing on the centre line, you're a straight luff on the sail, it's not going to be a deep running sail. And therefore, you do still need to have, if you want to go downwind, you'll never beat the spinnaker. You know, the symmetric spinnaker is always the best way to go dead downwind. A cruising chute will actually go fairly deep for you um, and be deeper than the genica. The genica is going to be very easy to handle if you're short-handed. And that's the, the pearl entrepreneur there with, with the Jennifer actually pulled out. So, any questions on that? I thought I'd mention that this time because it's, it's the, every year or every two years you, you get a, a new product that actually sort of catches the sailor's imagination. And this year it has been the Jennicas and the, the third against the cruiser The roller on the bottom of the Jennica, is yeah. that a geared one or? It's not geared, well, it is geared, it's, it's actually got, it's, it's a continuous line. Yes. So I'll just go back one In minute. teeth or something. It's, exactly. The rope is actually captive inside the, yes. the tooth there. This is actually the Facnor one. Now, I'm not usually a great lover of, of French stuff, but, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with Harkin present. I, I have to say that you know, the Harkin is, is, does one that does one as well, which is really nice. But, <laughs> yes, ten times the price. Well, I'm glad you said that. I couldn't no, say that. No, 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 try to no, it. Good. <laughs> but the actual, the French, they got into it first, you know, they, they did all the offshore boats, all the class 40s, 80s, all the like them. They actually have got a lot of experience in these, in these systems. And therefore, they, they, they're fairly inexpensive. They work very nicely. You've got a continuous rope here. Now, that rope um, on this boat is led all the way back to the cockpit, goes through lead blocks on the side of the stanchions, goes through a block on the, on the push bit onto, onto a winch. And so you can actually wind it up from the cockpit because he sails single-handed. If you're sailing with a crew, or just two people, I probably wouldn't recommend that because that's quite a lot of stretch in the system. You know, we want to have, it's better to have something that's more positive. And I prefer to see a much shorter little loop at the front. Just go forward, sit on the fore deck, back against the mast, and just work it from there. And that's with no, no sort of leads on it. And that's so easy to use. And then and the other thing about this system here, if you were going, um, you knew you were cracking off onto a broad reach somewhere to, to get around some headland, you could actually go and set this up beforehand, put the drum on there, hoist it up tight, leave it there, rolled up until he wanted to use it. So this is a factual system. The two that are most common nowadays are the factual or the carver. Both, both French, both very similar price. Um, carver is pretty easy to get hold of now, but both, both very good systems. That's it, roll it there. Now, I mentioned the two that are Jenica Furlers. This is the one that was on Persephone with the rope inside the luck of the sail. Therefore, you see the, the shape of the sail is restricted. 
it's actually going to be great for reaching. As soon as the wind goes after the beam, it's going to be less efficient. What happens then is again gets covered by the mainsail. If you, the more deeper you go, the wind then comes off the back of the leech of the mainsail, it gets to the lower side of the jenica, and then it comes crashing across, and the wife says, I'm never going to sail with you again. So, <laughs> so if you want to have a if you want to have a, uh, an asymmetric sail or a cruising suit, then this is the system that you have to have instead. So, so rather than having the anti-torsion rope inside the lap of the sail, it needs to be external. And the sail is then set independent, so you have a shell at the top, this is the actual top of the sail attached to, the shell at the bottom of the tack of the sail attached to, and then the rope, the anti-torsion rope, is actually free in between. Now there's two systems here. There's actually the factional system, which is called the ACMFX system, which has a little umbilical line. Now this, this blue line is, isn't actually um, evidence of this, but in fact on the um, factional, there's a little fine line that attaches the lock of the sail to the rope. And therefore when you rotate the rope, the tack and the head don't move. They're on swivels. But the sail is pulled into the anti-torsion rope, wrapped up around it, and it gets rid of the sail. Simple enough system. It is not as... It's not as easy as it sounds. It does take a lot of getting used to it. It takes a lot of getting the length of the tanks dropped down here right. But it, it does work. Um, it makes a bit of a mess, though, because you've got a lot of sail area being wrapped around a very small diameter. And it also takes an awful long time to do it. You've got a, you've got a 12mm rope here, and you've got a fine line. And before you start putting the sail in, you're putting the line in first, and then you're putting the sail in. And so you're taking a lot of revolutions. So when you sit there on the deck, you're back against the mast. Now, take a book with you. <laughs> <laughs> But it, but it does work. The alternative to that is what's called the top-down furler, which has been a lot, lot of these in the uh, magazines of late, whereby the top of the sail isn't on a swivel and the bottom is. And the reason they've done this is that originally because Packnell had a patent on, on, the, on the line, on this, and so no one else can actually use that system, and so they use the top-down furler. And the top-down furler, when you start rotating the drum at the bottom, it turns the rope, the swivels on the tacks on the swivels, that doesn't move at all, but the head does, and so the whole sail wraps into the top and makes a bit of a mess again, but does get rid of the sail. Two, what I'll say about this one, there's two problems I have with this. The first problem I have is you have to depower the sail to wrap it up. Therefore, if you're going on the foredeck, you're letting go of the sheets, the sheets are going forward, there's a lady sheet that's trying to lasso you, and it all gets a bit nasty, but you have to do that to depower it. You also have to make sure the top of the sail is a bit narrower than normal to get it to start wrap going. And it's much, much softer up there than normal as well. So, it's, so it's, there's a few things there you have to get right. You can't just sort of put the, the system onto an existing sail and hope it's going to work. It's never as easy as that. So I think of the two systems, we have probably had more success with the factional. Um, but both are, both are very good. Very good. Both are available to use. Um, I'm not so sure I'd recommend the Contessa. Two things with the, with the system. You have to make sure there's a drum, a place, space forward of the force lay for the drum to attach. That, that must be clear. Of, now, we've, we've shown you on the forefoot how we did it on Persephone. Doing that on a Contessa 32 the standard is quite awkward. You know, trying to find a strop that's forward of the force lay to set that, or having to put some kind of neat bowsprit on there, if that's possible. Another thing is the top. Because this has to attach, this is pulled up in the spinnaker halyard, you've got to make sure that swivel is clear of the roller reef engine swivel as well. And if you had a Z-spar mast, it won't work. You have to have a modification done because the, on the Z-spar, the actual spinnaker and the Genoa um, forestay are both together and you'll get the tube connected. So you have to have a metal plate on top of the, top of the mast with a small crane on it just gives separation. The Selden mast, which the majority of people who have, do have a crane on the top with a U-bolt and a block hanging from it. And that's usually enough to give enough separation. But when you furl these things, it's best to look up and just to make sure that everything's not getting caught. Any questions on any of those? Yes. I assume the, um, the torsion rope is, is quite a soft rope when you're dropping it down and handling it, but it, when you've got some tension on it, it firms up to it, some extent. It does. Well. There's, there's loads of different anti-torsion ropes. Right. Um, and the, best, the, the, better, the better the further you'll get, the more expensive the rope. Now the standard <coughs> one that most people use is by Leros. It's, it's a grey, it's got a kebab inside, it's got a tight um, outer, outer casing, which, as you say, as you tension it, it tightens up. <coughs> On the Contessa 32, then you've got like 38 feet, I think I'm maybe 40 foot of, of, of luff length there. You'll probably have, with a various rock, you probably still have to have about seven or eight turns before the top comes and joins the party. Even that with an anti torsion rope like the Leros one. If you paid for a Navtech one, which will cost you a thousand pounds, then you'll get really good torsion, you'll get very good quick furling. 
But the trouble with that is, well, to make it that good, it's a much stiffer rope. Mm. Like you're saying, George, there, because you want to fold this away so it doesn't take much accommodation up. Most of them, when the tension's off, they go quite soft and they'll fit into a standard spinach bag, rolled up like a sausage, you know, quite nicely. If you go for the very expensive one that's going to be good torsion, then it's much stiffer. It's like some have a resin on the outside, which makes them you know, really, really stiff. And I presume you probably have to have quite a lot of tension on the halyard. I'll stand yes. the spinnaker halyard and you just have to... Yes, I'll say with the spinnaker halyard, really. with these we recommend you upgrade the spinnaker halyard to a Dyneema. Yeah. If you spoke to Selden and told them you said, I'm going to have a, a Jenica, they'd tell you to have a two-to-one purchase on it. Really? Where, but you don't want that. It just doubles the expense of the rope. It doubles the time to hoist it. It gives them a chance of getting twists in it as well. No, so don't avoid that. Just, just have a good quality rope instead. You might have to keep the spinnaker halyard on the winch because your clutch won't like it, yeah, unless you upgrade the clutch as well. So, so all these things, but you do, George is dead right. You have to, to make this furl, you need a good tension on that stroke <coughs> to get it to furl nicely. If you have it too slack, you won't, you're trying to do sort of shut off, and what happens then, you, the, the, tra the torque doesn't get transferred to the top. Okay? Good. In a stand. Now I know Robin's going to be talking to you after me, so I'm not going to say too much about him, but it's, it's, it is important. You've got a, you, you now got a, a third in Geneva, which is okay, partly rolled to, to a certain position, but it's soon going to go to rats. Therefore, it's really important to have an inner stay or an ability to set a smaller headsail. Now, there's, there's several ways of doing this. Um, you can have a, a block and tackle underneath the stay here. You can have a, 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 a wishard adjuster. But it's, if you are going offshore or you're going to do long-distance cruising, I heartily recommend that you have an inner stay. Just having the furling system on its own is you haven't got a backup plan. If you've damaged the furling system, you haven't got anything you can set a sail on. So having the inner stay is, 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 in my opinion, is, is, uh, is necessary. You know, it's not mandatory, but it's, it's necessary. This is not isn't to contest it too, but it's just one I just found the, um, on, on the archive of pictures I had. But I would recommend that. And that you know, having a um, head weather jib or a storm jib that hangs onto that is a, is a great way to go. The alternative. Anyone heard of a gale sail? Ah, guy has good. Well, the actual gale sail, it was, it was invented years ago. Um, it's now actually made, the gale sail as such, it was, was actually patented, and is, is, is now made in China, sold through Florida, um, and by a company called ATN. Obviously, I wouldn't recommend you got the Chinese sail, but the concept is, is, is quite good. Um, if you actually don't have an inner stay, and you want to have the ability to set a storm jib, there's a lot of Mickey Mouse ways that would get you through coding. I know when no one here is going to do any, any coding on it for, for charter work, but to get through coding, all you have to do is have a storm jib that can be set independent of the force day. And so that ends up, you, have, you, you get storm jibs made with a bit of rope in the lap and a, a couple of bits of string that tie around the field up to know. That all, that's, that, that all complies. And so if you, for you to use and say yourself, not interested in what charters do, you need to do it properly. So if you don't have the inner stay, then the gale sail is great because it gives you the tension of the force day to actually set the sail on. So therefore, the sail will set, and there's half a chance you could sail off a lee shore with that sail, which you wouldn't be able to do with some Mickey Mouse system just setting the storm jib flying. On the gale sail, you can't see from the photograph here, it actually, the, the red part there, or the orange part we see at the front, wraps around the rolled up to now, then hangs back to itself. So it's so then, then hoisted up by the spinnaker halyard, so it fits around the rolled up to It doesn't actually damage the rolled up to because it's actually got has um, very anti chafe the sleeve. It's actually spreading the load at <coughs> a much greater distance than point loading with power beams or, or, or strings or weddings. So when it's set, it's great. This actually uh, photograph here, I did get off the ATN's website, which I thought was a little bit bizarre, really, because, you know, did you want to be up here setting, a, setting the gale sail? <laughs> I think every gale sail should come with a snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> So I go back to my previous point about the inner stay. I think that the inner stay with the, with the other hank on, take that board, hank on a storm jib, hank on a small jib, small jib, is the better way to go. But there is an option here. If you haven't got the inner stay, then this is a good way of actually setting a sail when it is set um, and getting some good tension on it. ATN, the same company here. Um, I'm interested in getting the thing about, about, about cruising chutes. Now, if you haven't got um, a bow sprit, Setting a cruising chute has always been a bit of a problem with the Contessa because if you actually set the actual downhaul line for the cruising chute inside the pulpit, as soon as you actually get any pressure in the sail, it blows down to leeward. The bow line, the downhaul, then fouls the pulpit, bends the pulpit. 
or you have to have the bowman going outside of the pulpit into a block around the stem head or somewhere, and then and straight away the sail, the downhill is longer, and you float, you're, you're not sailing as close to the wind as you was down as deep as you want to because the sail's sailing so far to leeward. The tacker is this system here, just a small piece of black, uh, white polypropylene that actually is moulded with a webbing around it and a, and a snap shackle to hold it in place. So it, roll, it just tips on to roll up to Noah, and to the, onto that part there you put the tack of the cruising ship. The company ATN here claim that you can use this on spinnakers as well. I wouldn't. If you actually, the spinnaker is actually 1.8 times the J measurement wide, therefore it's, your J measurement is 12.66 feet, 3.84 metres. Therefore, 1.8 times that is going to give you 6.95 metres of sail from the centre line going back sideways. So, that, so that, that's going to give you all the heaving force you don't want. Um, if you're trying to sail deep with that, you know, it's, you, the whole thing becomes unstable if you ease it out enough. So I would never recommend using a spinnaker on this, but I would recommend as a good way of actually setting a cruising suit that's not going to damage your pulpit. And uh, so we do sell a lot of these. We recommend them to the majority of the customers we've got who, who have this sort of pulpit arrangement. The other thing about it is the block here needn't even be forward of the forestay. It can be just after the forestay, either, either one side, because this is now the tack position. So it's, it gives you a lot more variables. Excuse me, Peter. Yeah. What is that actually made of? The, uh, it's just plastic. It is just plastic. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, here's one I made earlier. I went out of camera shop towards, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. This is actually. Let's pass that back. Yeah. Yeah. So As you say, you wouldn't use that with a contested spinnaker because it's, it's the foot's too. Part of it. Yeah, ATN actually do advocate you can. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> no, no. So, so we never do. No. But it's a very neat little system. It's, uh, um, it, it's in the old days, we did used to do this, but made them up out of sailcloth. And the trouble with that is they did compress around the pearl up to know a bit too much and point load of it. Whereas these don't, they, they spread the load nicely. So I, I would recommend that. Any questions? We're doing well for it. How are you doing time, Holly? You're fine. We're using up the RNLI time now, which is oh, right. absolutely fine. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> They're not here. I should have given Jay a call. Uh, unless he's come in. No, carry on. The same, the same company, um, ATN. Now, this is how ATN started life, actually making these sleeves, the snuffers. Now, on, cru on spinnakers, cruising suits, if you're saying short-handed, then, then the snuffer is a great idea. There's an awful lot of rubbish ones out there. And if it's, a cheap, if it's cheap, there's a reason it's cheap. No. And so whatever you do, no, I don't know why, where you buy your snuffers from. I actually now, we've given up making our own, we actually buy the parts of the ATN sleeve and make them up using those parts. They are expensive, but they, they just work. Um, I was actually, I hate to sort of swear here, it was actually um, sales I was making for a J120. And I knew Rod Johnson quite well because I got involved with the J24s when they first came to the country. And the phone up, I said, I understand that you're actually advocating a special snuffer to go on your J120 uh, asymmetrics. He said, yeah, yeah, talk to ATN. And they make them, don't try and make it your own. And so we did. So we spoke to the, and ATN actually is a bit of a play on words, because it's owned by a Frenchman called Etienne. <laughs> <laughs> and he lives in Florida, and at the time, he was just making these, and making them himself down there in Florida, which is, and, and they're great. Um, they, they actually got a, a sleeve that's incredibly porous. So many things you have to think about with the snuffer. When you actually raise the snuffer up to release the spinnaker, you've got to import it that the air can get out. And it's there for the, the seed. It must be totally porous. Now, I've seen the other sound because use only spinnaker nylon for that. Of course, spinnaker nylon is made to be non-porous. And so then, they, then it doesn't work. Then you start be cutting holes and then let the air out. And so you get this hydraulic problem you know, you're trying to get around. So this is totally porous and it works a treat. The actual mouth shape is elliptical and is made of a, of a Kevlar and is very small, very fine, very light. And therefore, the top of the mast doesn't damage the mast. As it is elliptical, and it's got little bridles that work on the downhaul, it actually does square the, the snuffer correctly with the head of the sail so it comes down, rather than just sort of distort or squeeze around to the top and damage the sail. The downhaul, you see this, this young lady's um, clue down here, is actually a bigger diameter than the, than the, other, than the upper. And therefore, as the continuous rope goes up and down, the bit you have to pull, they make twice the diameter of the, of the rope that's just doing the travelling inside the sleeve. So, Shouldn't really sort of advocate that, but, but if you came to sign the sales, the chances are we'd actually quote you for this and, and, and a cheaper one, but I'll push you very hard on, on that moment. <laughs> sail cloth. Before I jump into sail cloth, any questions? Uh, right, I've, I've got 
Much like sort of talk compacted in there, so I've done it quite well. Self off. Now, there's big changes. But I mentioned in the beginning that um, up until uh, last year, the Contessa 32 was only allowed to use woven fabric that was uncoated in the word of the rule. Um, coated Dacron is actually that what you get on a, a racing dinghy is a low, crispy, crunchy fabric. So we actually, when I helped write the rule years ago, we actually put in the word pregnated, not co impregnated, not coated to avoid people using uh, coated uh, Dacron. Unfortunately, that seems to have missed a lot of cell makers, and there was actually one cell maker in particular who actually did make coated Dacron for the maintenance of engineers, and that which caused some issues when we found out about it. Um, but, but generally, everyone's pretty good nowadays when they had to keep within this rule. This loft here, this mill here, is actually an island. Stanley probably remember it. Yeah, it's the hood loft. It's the hood, it's the hood mill. Yeah. yeah, it's the hood mill island. Now, when hoods were in Newington, the only well, latterly, the only time they've ever sell sales over us is when they use their fabric. And I have to say that I knew it was good fabric. Um, I didn't know how good it was until I was lucky enough to be able to use it ourselves. Probably about sort of five, six years ago, um, Hoods came to us, or Tim Woodhouse came to us and asked whether we wanted to use the cloth. Well, first he said, do you want my company? He said, no, here's, here's, hood, here's Hood in Lewington. Do you, I don't want it anymore. <laughs> Take it off me. And, and I didn't, because that time, although Hood... When I first started, you know, in 1974, there was 40 employees at Hood. You know, it was the biggest sell off in the world, the um, biggest sell maker in the world. Um, when he came and saw me, they were down to five here. They're not very experienced people, all the good people are left. Left to us, actually. <laughs> 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 and and the, good, the only good thing about the, the whole um, company was actually their mill in Ireland making the cloth. So he asked me well, if, I, if I wouldn't take the company, would I, would I use the cloth? And so for, for two years, I, I became the biggest user in the world of hood fabric. And that was the hood Dacron and the hood Vectron. And I was the only non-hood loft allowed to use Vectron. Now Vectron and the hood circle, the reason why it's so good is the length of these looms. Looms nowadays are made one and a half, two meters wide. In the hood mill, they're only three feet wide. And the reason, well, that, that, this is what, um, the old, when you have a bobbin going back and forth in, in, in a loom, you actually, um, can't go wider than one point, or so, the nine one four centimeters or uh, thirty six inches, because the bobbin has to go back and forth every time you lift the yard, the walk, walk yards up. The bobbin goes across and into them down again, and if any wider than that, you couldn't get that bobbin back and forth quick enough. And so, three foot wide was was, was the standard width then. They didn't use the bobbins originally there. They, they actually upgraded to a, to a more modern system whereby the yarn is taken across on a on a hook. And it was a, it's taken on the hook and the knife picks it up and takes it back the other way. And so that was, that was a modern day way of making it, but it's still very old fashioned compared to the high speed looms utilised by Dimension Polyac Contender, you know, the other big manufacturers in the, in the world. So the reason why it's so good is because of this, because they could get such a tight weave in the cloth. And because it was woven so tightly, there's much less stretch in the bias, and therefore there's, the cell itself didn't stretch so much. The move, less movement in the arms, less, less internal shape in the arms, and it lasted that much, that much longer. So when they actually closed the loom down as well, two years ago now, um, we were sad to see it go. So we actually then had to go out into the marketplace and find a fabric for our sales that would replace the hood fabric. That was harder than I thought it would be. I hadn't actually been buying commercially for the majority of our working sales um, because of buying the best they could from the hood there. So I went back in the marketplace and I found out something quite Surprising. Um, Bainbridge, which when I first started in, well, no, so in they were about 1980, early 80s, they started bringing cloth into the country in the 80s, and it was fantastic. It was a very big American company. It then went through quite a few evolutions where it's owned by English people and then French people. It's now owned uh, by a, a, a Frenchman, John Short. But they've given up making good cloth. They're actually just now working to make fabric for the production market. So they buy a cell from the China Cell Factory, um, which you might have done without knowing you had. Um, the actual cloth would have been probably Bainbridge fabric. And so we don't touch it now. So it, it is the cheapest cloth. When I <coughs> looked at the prices, it, was, it cost me half the price of the a yard of hood cloth. So the Bainbridge is that much cheaper. And so I realise now that people come to me and say, oh, you know, so-and-so is, is this much cheaper than you. I can now see why. And so I then had to make the decision, okay, do I actually then make sales out of that cloth as well um, to be competitive, or do I offer options or or do I just stick, stick my guns? And so, in the end, I decided to offer three options now. We do bronze, silver, and gold, um, and gold which, I'll, which I'll come to in a minute. This is just, just quickly on the fabric front here. Yeah, I just, I, I've been whizzing through using this terminology. 
But just, there's a roll of cloth. The warp yarn is the long, the long yarn on the, on the fabric. This is the fill yarn or the weft. Exactly the same thing. That's actually 90 degrees of cloth. That, on a woven fabric, that yarn is always going to be the best. If you load up that yarn, this is why so many fabrics, the majority of fabrics, are actually, sorry, majority of sails are cross cut. You see the panels going up the sail horizontally? That's because you're loading up that yarn. And that yarn is always going to be the one straightest. It's what we call crimp, not less crimp, not crimp less. You'll have less crimp in that yarn than the warp yarn will. And the bias, that's the 45 degrees. Now, the actual bias is not a problem on a, well, it depends. When you choose a fabric for a mainsail, so we've got two, two titan sail shapes here. This is, this is a typical sort of mainsail aspect ratio, those are jib. And this is a Genoa aspect ratio. Now, on a Genoa, we've got, like very typical on a Contessa 32, you've got a foot length, which is about half the luff length. So you've got two to one aspect ratio. The loads are into the, into the sail at 45 degrees. Now, if you've got a cross cut fabric, the loads are actually taken on the bias. So a Genoa fabric must be really good on the bias here. And therefore, when we decide on the fabric for that, we choose one that's got a yarn in the warp and the weft that's very similar in denier, denier being the weight of the yarn. By making it similar, it's a sort of balanced construction, there's more chance of getting a very tight weave on the bias, because there's, there's, there's very similar yarns. Um, you don't get that disproportionate sort of stretching. On a mainsail, or a high, number three here, high aspect, you see the loads are much more up and down the leach. And therefore, this yarn here is much more heavily loaded. Therefore, for a mainsail fabric or a number three fabric, the yarns here is much heavier down denier than on the warp because you're not worried too much about the bias so much now because that isn't going to be as good. But you are loading up that weft yarn and it has to be stronger. And so that mainsail fabric will have probably maybe two or three times the weight yarn in the weft than in the warp, whereas the denier would have a similar. Whisk through that. I just mentioned to you, Dak. This, I need to help you with this one actually, because anyone who's received a quotation from us recently for the sale would have been given these options. Now, this is just starting in Dacron. Now, I scaled up the hood fabric, I then entered the marketplace, I looked at the, the fabrics. Now, when I first started in 1974, there was five sailcloth manufacturers in this country, six of you included Ireland. Now, there's five in the world. So, we don't have the choice. As I said earlier, you know, Bainbridge gave up trying to make good cloth and they just make the cheap one. But the, the best one now, we, we, try, we tested them all, we, we, looked, we, we obviously took a sample of each fabric, we tested it, compared it with the fabric, etc. The fabric that we found that was nearest to that was made by a company called Dimension Polyant. Now they, their top range is called their AP and their SF. Um, doesn't sound very posh, but it actually, it's, a very, it's all high tasty yarn, all very tightly woven, very good UV finish on it, and it's expensive. And it, that, that, once again, is twice the cost of the Bainbridge. So that's what, gold quotient here, you'll be getting a dimension point AP or SF fabric. In the silver, once again, we're going to try and find something with still high tenacity, but was more cost effective. So we used another dimension point fabric called Sea Breeze. Same constructions as the gold here, but what they do is they use a larger denier yarn, therefore it's quicker to weave. And therefore it's still got high tenacity yarns, but it's woven quicker, therefore the bias isn't as good, but it's still high tenacity, so it's great. I keep mentioning high tenacity because on the bronze, um, we offer either a uh, challenge fabric or the Bainbridge fabric, and they tend to use a, a medium tenacity yarn in the warp direction and then use the good quality yarn in the, in the ref uh, direction because they argue you only need to have a good quality yarn in the yarn that's been loaded. What we find is that the medium tenacity yarn actually degrades <coughs> a bit much quicker in UV, and we get a lot of sales into the loft now, which are only two, three years old, whereby the actual weft yarns are broken down, so warp yarns are broken down. And the sail was tears, and it spits up the leech of the sail, here's that, because of, because of the cheaper fabric. And they stretch like earlier and distort and over the So if you can find a better way that I can actually put over to the customer the options of the sail cloth, then I'll be all ears. <coughs> but this is at the moment, this is this is the three options that we offer. Pete. Pete. Yeah. Can, can you um <coughs> Uh, I'm interested in the woven Vectron. Can you now get an equivalent woven Vectron fabric? Yes, yes. This is interesting, actually, that George mentions here, but Vectron was an exclusive hood fabric. Mm. And it was an exclusive patented fabric, so no one could actually make this. And every other sailcloth supplier and every other sailmaker complained about it. Oh, look, they actually rubbished it. They said, oh, this Vectron is rubbish. No, it's, 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 only, it's only a good quality Dacron. The Vectron's doing nothing. <laughs> and they all said that. You know, and um, I actually bit more open-minded. I, I tested it and I used it when I was allowed to use it and I liked it. So I have an opinion about it. Interesting enough, when the hood mill closed down, 
immediately three other cloth suppliers started making Vectra. <coughs> One made it sort of, um, well, it's supposed to be legally, because he was actually um, employed by Tim Woodhouse, the area of her, to actually make it in America, a company called Challenge. And he, he, Tim Woodhouse convinced Bob Bainbridge, funny enough, Bob Bainbridge is the son of original Bainbridge, you know, left the Bainbridge company, started Challenge Shelf. <laughs> But his, he actually convinced Bob Bainbridge that there was still a patent outstanding on Vectron, and so gave him, in theory, all the, all the construction details of it, and he started to make it. We bought some, didn't like it as much. It, it's the, the challenge Vectron, I think, because it was made on the new looms, and then tried to use the same process, just using new looms. It was very crunchy in feel, a lot more finish on it. Didn't seem to have the concentration of yarn, although they told me it did. Um, didn't test as well as the original hood Vectron. Um, so we didn't buy from there, we tried the first bit, didn't like that. So we waited until Dimension Polyant brought out one, and also Contender. Now Dimension Polyant, because they make another fabric called Hydronet, I don't know if you've come across Hydronet, Hydronet is a, a woven dynema, um, in, in, a, in a, a woven fabric, therefore that sort of conflicted with Vectron. So they weren't really keen on doing that worldwide, but they did offer it for Europe. And it's a good one, um, it's okay, it's better than the challenge, but the best one, strange enough, we've found so far is from a company called Contender. Um, they're actually a Dutch company, and they actually uh, went about, they wanted to end up with a similar product, product but went about the weaving process in a different way, um, rather than trying to do it on the wider looms. Their cloth is still 914 wide in the, in the, in the uh, 7.7. .7. It goes wider in the 9.4. And we tested theirs, and it's interesting enough, my production manager, Stuart, you know, he, when he cuts sales um, through the, you know, through the cloth, you can tell what cloth's like just through the cutting of it. And he just said, when you got the challenge one compared to the hood one, there's no comparison. Far too easy to cut the, the actual challenge one. But the contender one is much more like that, there's much more concentration of the iron in there. And when we use the cutter to cut the fabric on, the actual strategy is a ceramic blade to cut the vectron. And it's, you get through quite a few of the blades as well, so it's just such a densely woven fabric. So vectron's great. Now, I didn't mention vectron earlier. In, we have used um, quite a few contestant sales. Persephone's got all vectron sales. Um, vectron actually has a yarn called Vectran incorporated actually in the weave, in the weft. Now, having the spectran in there um, means it greatly increases the stretch resistance of the cloth. And I mean, it does it significantly. If you actually compare those, it, it only works for any work. It is particularly good on high aspect sales, because times when you are loading up those warp, those weft yarns with the vectron in them, is fantastic. When it's not so good, it's low aspect sales. When you go to low aspect, you can have a better bias. Well, the bias of vectron, despite what Tim Woodhouse says, is no better than a good quality dapron. And so you are using disproportionate yarn sizes there, therefore the bias isn't great. So it's great for many sorts. It's good, it's good for generals with um, LPs up to 135%. I wouldn't go bigger than that because there's too much bias in the clue. Then there's sort of no heavy clues in there to stop the cells from stretching. Okay, laminates. So finish the woven ones, so laminates. Now the actual, anyone here going to be sort of doing your racing? No? Right. Might, so. Might do. I'm, <laughs> <interested>. <laughs> right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave you know, a lot of them outside to Robin. Um, but moving on to that, we've got the woven there, we've got the woven dacrons, we've got the vectron. Laminates here. This is actually, when you buy fabric, this is, this is a laminator. So you have a choice. So, you know, if you want to um, have a fabric that has less stretch in it, you have to find one that's got less crimp. A way to avoid crimp is to don't weave it. And therefore, you don't weave something, you, you take a layer of, of mylar film. You put a yarn inside it, you just lay the yarn inside it, and then put another layer of mile on the other side and laminate the two together. That's originally what they did back in the, back in the 80s. The original mylar are called triplies, just two layers of mylar film with a, a layer with a scrim of polyester inside. The advantage of that is <coughs> so there's nothing, nothing woven. You've got dead, dead straight uh, yarn just laid down two layers of mylar film. When you load that yarn up, you're loading up a yarn that has no crimp in it, therefore it's less stretch. And the other advantage is obviously it's lighter. So, in theory, you know, it's, it's a great system. Now, I wouldn't recommend anyone with a contestant who has a laminate that's only a film on film. There's no durability in that. To actually provide durability to a laminate, you have to add taffeta. Now, taffeta can be either one or two layers. So you have one layer on the one side laminate, it's what we used to use. Actually, both, on the second test day too, one of the fast knit, in a class two-handed. Can you put it now? She, she, no, 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 this is going back a while, isn't it? Um, Harry Alloy's uh, Harring Angel. Harring Angel. Harring Harring Angel. Angel. Harring Harring Angel. Harring, yeah. Now, that would have had, we made a Pentex uh, number one genre for her, which was in, in this land of Pentex. She wasn't one of the class rules at the time. It was illegal under class rules. It wasn't illegal under IRC, which was the racing rule she should say, the fast under. And therefore, she had a sale. So, layer on our film, 
pentax yarn inside, maybe a lower mylar, and a taffeta on the outside to give it durability. All the sales up in Scotland for Contessa 32s, we were made for that as well, we're racing Contessas, because they were interested in what's happening in the racing classes down here, because it was just a, you know, just a very small little band of brothers here who were racing in class, and therefore they, they didn't want to have that on sales, and so they had the, the mylar sales up there years ago. What's taffeta? Taffeta is a very lightweight dacron. So it's a woven dacron, but it only weighs about an ounce. And now that when you actually make a sale, imagine you've got your mylar film, you've got the scrim on top, mylar film on top of that, then the taffeta. What that does is actually fills the gaps between all those holes in the scrim, because they're the bits that break down. So you'll, you'll find the laminate racing sale will break down very quickly through hinging. The taffeta actually just gives some guts to the fact that the sale and makes it last that bit longer. Makes them white, too. Makes them white, yes. It's pretty important. Well, seriously, one of the early objections to high tech sales of the contestants, they did what horrible yeah. car yeah. charge on for eight. So right. I have a lot of sympathy with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. Yes. <laughs> yes, so, um, so yeah, I think the boat went on Genoa. This, um, we did actually make the early ones just in the tripod, just in the mylar, probably just in the mylar, for the contestants up in Scotland. But they don't last that long. Mind you, they probably last at the same time as the Dacron Tri Rangel does, the, you know, up, not two couple of years ago. I mentioned this here, now membrane production. Now, this we mentioned before, that guy mentioned the exotic constructions. There's, the membrane sails are custom made, and so the sail maker will actually take the design, will design a sail, or we do, we have, we have a software called uh, Azure, Smart Azure, which is an Italian design. And it's actually, we design the sail on that, then we transport that design into another program called Relax. Now, Relax actually shows you all the loads in the sail. And from the loads, you can then work out how big the yarn has to be in any particular area to counter those loads. And therefore, we end up with a custom sale with yarns of any type, can be polyester, pentex, carbon, Kevlar, Vectran. So you can choose the type, the type of yarn, you can choose the denue of that yarn, and you can choose the concentration of that yarn. And they're, they're laid up on this design, and then we send it away to a laminator. There is no laminator in this country. So we have to look broad. Now, in the past, we've used Italy, which was a mm, bit of a disaster. Generally now, we, we tend to use uh, three companies. Uh, D4, um, which is in Germany or in America. And the third one is actually where these photographs are taken, is actually in South Africa. This actually is the um, SAM membrane, it's called South African membranes. It's actually in part of the quantum loft. So anyone who's had a quantum laminate sale, that's where it would be made. Um, they've given up the quantum agency now because they've got put up not getting paid. <laughs> which, which, which I don't know why, us makers are used to that. It's, it's a very romantic trade we have. Uh, so, so, this, so they're now sort of, I think they're making uh, sales for anyone who actually who has the software to send the design to them. And then they'll actually use, this is a long head machine and every yarn is laid down. You see, it's, it's hard to tell on the thing here. On that first photograph I showed you, on, I'll show you that photograph again in a minute. You can see a close up of all these yarns. So you see they're put down in bunches. Now, this, mach this machine here, now this, this, this block, they actually don't want you to see this. When they send me the photographs, they, they blank this out. I'm not so sure what is so, so the secret there, but they've actually covered it up so you can't see probably it. Probably just a black cardboard box. That's probably it, <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, so coloured colour box. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I'll show you the yarn. But you see these bunches here? There's actually, the, the yarns are laid down in bunches at a time. And they have, a, they have a comb which sits on the end of this arm here and it's laid down. Now the comb could have 8, 10, 12, 14 or 16 heads on it. And that depends how many yarns you put down. So the bigger the sail, the more yarns you put down in one go. So when we test the two, you probably have, probably have 10, 10 yarns put down at once. That just speeds the process up. Um, you don't go too wide with it because obviously when the, when the arms come into the corner, they're no longer taking the loads into the corner, they're actually spreading it around the corner. So nowadays, so just quickly to, to touch on the, the new rule, the new rule now allows uh, the Contessa 32 to have a mainsail and the genoa made in a fabric that is either polyester with a film on film without taffeta, or I mean, any other exotic yarn that's allowed under the IRC, so it's carbon, kevlar, or vectran, inside uh, a laminate like this, but it must have a layer of taffeta. Now, the reason they actually said this is to make sure that the sale, the owner was actually buying sales that were disposable. So to encourage people to buy a sale that's going to last, and therefore stop checkbook sailing in the class, they included this, this layer of taffeta. Well, that, what it does actually, in fact, unfortunately, increases the cost of the sale quite a lot, 
because laying a, adding a layer of taffeta to the sail does actually increase the cost of it, but it does actually add durability. You will be seeing a lot of these actually on the head saws of contessas. Personally, I don't think they're necessary um, or advantageous on the mainsail. I think the aspect ratio of the mainsail is very good with the deck on. You can go for laminate, there'd be no weight saving from it, there'd be a little bit of stretch resistance you'll gain, but not the biggest gains we'd have on the head saws. There's the one I mentioned earlier. There's my, so you can see close up here, those bunches of yarn, they're all, they're all laid out. That, so that doesn't have taffeta? That doesn't That's have taffeta. Great. This, this actually is an illegal sale for Calypso to use under the new rule. This was actually made for the Round Rana <coughs> race. Gigi had one similar, you remember know, Gigi, um, when they raced round. They had a carbon Kevlar one. This is one called, this is Carbon Technora. <coughs> they're two of my favorite yarns put together in a laminate sale. The, the load-bearing yarns here, we, we use carbon for, and the cross yarns, we use Technora. Now, Technora is an arrow made like Kevlar, but it's got a much better UV resistance and a much better resistance to hinging. And so it's a fantastic uh, carrying yarn. I, ironically, that Technora is more expensive than carbon. But, um, but the, the carbon is better in, in the high load areas. So, so, that's, so for that sale now to be legal under the new class rules, we're going to have to stick a layer of taffeta on the outside of it. But obviously we won't be doing that. Yeah. yeah. Comment on the new rule then, tack height. Another part of the new rule says that the tack of the sail must be 140 mil above here. That's my boat. <laughs> I've just noticed. <laughs> <laughs> no. Recognise so, that? No. Before I continue this illegal boat here. <laughs> 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 this, this is George's, George's boat. He's actually having a visit to Lymington at the moment. So I had a sneaky look on, on board here. Now this, this is about as close as you can get the drum down with a Harkin furling system. Very nice. I must say, very nice system, I understand. Very, very, very low. Now that's great because if you had this, this is still going to give you probably nearly 200 mil, isn't it, George? No? I think. Uh, it's about 190, 200, somewhere around there. Yeah, that's the the so it's actually a racing boat, any other racing contestant out there without a furling system will have a little strop on his genoa, which will actually be a little bit lower than that. And the reason we've actually incorporated that into the, into the rule is to make sure that anyone who's cruising isn't badly disadvantaged if they're going to a race. So it's, it's a good idea. So. Um, 140 is the height they've given. This is, this is the best you'd achieve. If you do do this, you haven't got to hope you haven't got an anchor underneath. So it does just fit, actually, but it's not very convenient. It's not convenient. We, we actually we tried this actually on several contestants, ended up putting a link plate in. This is the no, typical contestant here, rum, rum line. Um, that actually has the, the link underneath it. You get, you get, when you only buy a furlex, you, you can have an added option of buying a 90 mil link, which will give you a lot more height to allow the anchor to work underneath. But look at the height difference here. The sail up here is going to be cosmetically displeasing if you're racing. Whereas this one here obviously is going to be, you can still sail with this for racing or cruising without disadvantaging yourself too much. In practice, Pete, does the bottom six inches of the sail, bearing in mind all the turbulence, make a huge difference? I think that um, this here doesn't, there's what we lost here. I think the uh, mark eye who I had a lot of time for, I met Mark I at uh, Bristol University. Clever guy, but boy was he confusing. He, he, he actually made a big deal at, of what, what's called the end plate effect. And therefore closing off the actual high pressure um, of the leeward side of the sail and the low pressure of the inside of the sail <coughs> was important. So you didn't get stopped one, the high pressure was going around to, to, the, to, the, to the actual one on the side. And have, if you, so the close off is, is, is therefore is disadvantageous if that happens. So closing that end plate effect off is Theory, in theory, um, necessary. What we found in practice is boats like the Contessa, who like to heal a little bit, don't actually have the bottom of the sail actually addressed to the wind anyway. The part of the, the sail that's been addressed to the wind is, is, is above there, and therefore doesn't seem to have the effect that, that um, the market thought at the time and what we found out in the future. So we don't, you know, same with main source, you know, we put everyone, all main source now loose footing. You know, originally they had a shelf, but to, to create the same plate effect to close off, it, it, it isn't. Um, the bigger deal as it was, everyone thought it was. Yeah. I think with, with this here, I think it actually is not slowing the boat down particularly. Cosmetically, it's a bit of a problem. Not a problem. It's, for me, I, I prefer it. It wasn't there. Um, but it does mean that it's, it's now a, an even playing field for, for cruising people who want to come and race. They can turn up. The good thing about the rule as well, the number one Genoa rule just says 32 square metres maximum size. 
and therefore you can do what you like. Therefore, in theory, a higher spec number three genera complies to the rule. Um, therefore, any person's sale here that they've got might be undersized before is now legal. It was made in, in polyester cruise land is now legal. And so any of those sales, you can turn up, take part in an event, and you'll be, I wouldn't say you'll be competitive, but in the right condition to be competitive, but the, the sales you've got are legal. Okay. That actually is on Clipso. Now, interestingly enough, this is when the first boat was first built, and that got lowered soon after. Um, this was the Dacron. We made a set of Dacron sales for it. They put the, the half and drum on. Then they actually modified that. No, I'm not sure they did it just down, but they ended up getting rid of this plate here, didn't they? And they end up That's the half and long thing plates. Mm -hmm. You yeah. can actually shorten them, but which is good. Or, or replace it with a toggle, which gets it as low as you possibly yeah. can. Yeah, and I think that that's what they did massively for the toggle there, because um, when they ended up racing around the island race, this, this drum was actually right down on top of the gunway. Rig set up. Okay. Now, have I got time to carry on? We are running a little bit over. So, shall I shut up now? Um, well, the, the options are that we carry on for a bit longer and we can switch Robin to just after lunch with Francois. So, we'll still do Harkin before, or we can stop and try and move through what would everyone prefer. Carry on. I'm going to quick read this. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll make it quick so you can have a total of the point back at the loft. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll, 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 go I'll, until you can. I'll, I'll, I'll just go, yeah, go another, another 10 minutes or so. Just, I'm not going to do much on rig setup because obviously I'm not a rigger, but the, and the, but the contestant has got a nice simple rig. And all these you know, money you spend on sales, there's two things that are uh, far more important than, than the sale, or as important as the sale. A is the rig setup. And B is the underside of the hull. So, if you, you know, the hull, I you know nothing about Andy Fan, nothing about smoothing, but I know you can't all dry sail, I know some people do. But um, that makes such a difference to a contestant's performance. But rig setup, I've seen some horror stories, but the thing with the contestant 32 is a nice simple rig. There she is. We've got catch rounds in the centre, forward lowers, aft lowers, back stay and fore stay. Can't be simpler than that. You can't play around with it too much. But it is so important to get that set up right for the sales. Force day sag is what we try to eliminate. Now, force day sag is um, if you have no backstay adjuster, or you have, I don't know if you have it on that. Okay. There we go. Backstays here. This is the, one of the most common adjusters on the Contessa. And of course, it's a nightmare. Because it is a nightmare, you don't use it. The time you actually went unwound it for the lure blade, you actually put it back on again for the windward blade. So, what I would say, forget. Anyone with a, a, a rotary reefing system, if you fitted a, a little hydraulic um, system instead, it would be far more beneficial. Um, keeping the two things happen with the backstay adjuster. A, you can easily adjust the sag in the front of the sail to suit the sail. Therefore, you've got one sail, 140%, doing all the work, yet you expect that sail to do all that work without adjusting the rig to suit it. So when we as sailmakers design the sail, we have to design a aspect ratio, I'm sorry, we have to design a force a sag that that sail will set on. So we take a wind strength, say 15 knots, we then work out how much force the sag boat's going to have in 15 knots, and we design the sail to that. Therefore, in light airs, you're not going to get that force they sag, and therefore you have to allow for more tension, and the, the, um, less tension in the reef, and therefore <coughs> letting off the backstay will actually make that sail sag, and you end up with the sail correctly shaped. As the wind increases, the force they sag increases, the sail will get deeper. Then you whack on your backstay, tension the force stay, and that will actually take that sag out and make, maintain the sail shape longer. So of all the things on the boat, back, the backstay on the masthead rig boat, as simple as the contestants, is the most critical. And to get the best performance out of the contestant and improve the sail shape and the amount of time you need the full genera out, I'd recommend investing in a good backstay adjuster. It doesn't have to be hydraulic. I know when this is our cantilever in the old days, we had a, a lever on that, just like the old Sigma 33's kicker. Um, very simple, even in English Romans, that's just a cascade system. Um, but it's got to be something that actually goes on and off with ease. I just uh, say that because I've got a pretty powerful hydraulic backstay. Yes. It, the other thing is it opens up the leaks in the main like nobody's business, it just takes all the weather helm off. It will do. Well, the, the main, once again, we have to cut, when we design the main saw, we have to design the main to suit the mast bent. If we go on board a boat and we find someone's got that wheel there, we say they're not going to touch that mast. And so, so we actually look at the mast, we check the bend, and we design to that bend, which on a contested day two probably is nothing. <laughs> with, with, with forward and after lowers, catch rounds, you know, it's going to be probably dead plumb straight. 
You might get, if someone's over tension, the forward, the forward lowers more than the after lowers, you might get a little bit of pre-bend. Then you might allow for you know, 15, 15 mil maximum. If we go on board and see if someone's got a hydraulic backstay, then we actually put in there up to 50 mil, up to two inches of bend in the front. Saying, even for cruising, mm. when you've got a lot of weather helmet, it can test, it gets really tired because of the things yeah. you do all the time. Yes. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Don't like a taste of wood. <laughs> <laughs> so, so once again, as, as, as Robin says, you know, having the backs adjusted to because it does the tension of force state at the same time, it actually bends the mast. The bend, the, the way the mast bends, will all depend on the tension on the forward levers. If that's what tension on that, that prevent the mast from actually um, going uh, sort of staying where it is. You know, actually, actually bend the mast, head the mast back, the forward lower, hold it forwards, and you get forward, you get curve in the front of the mast. So we do now when so we're now probably up to two inches in that. When we made Trader Joe's sales, because James is a bit of a monster on his, on his back today, <laughs> not only did have it, Jeremy had to reinforce all his chain plate bases and everything else, we, we actually end up putting the 60 mil bend on his because he just, in all weathers, he likes sailing on a knife edge. And I think it's he, maybe him and uh, Jason Kerr, who used to helm with him a lot, very good concentration, which you have to have if you're sailing with a very flat entry. And so whatever the wind strength was, he whacked on the hydraulic backstay to get a very flat entry on, on the tail tail to be sail on that knife edge. Which is okay if the sea's flat and you can concentrate, but it's, it's, it's very hard to sail that way. So this, it's just critical. So if, anyone hasn't, if anyone's just got this, this little wheel here still, it's okay for, you know, for cruising, but if you want to get the best performance out of the sails, and as Robin says, reduces the weather helm by flattening the mainsail, then that's a really good investment. Now just going back one here. This, isn't a Contessa 32, but I couldn't find a Contessa 32 that was set up as badly. This is a Sadler. Now look at that mast there, it's inverting backwards. Now, this happens if you were forced, if you actually don't have enough backstay tension. It's, it's what happened, this is very common actually, people go and buy themselves a hydraulic backstay adjuster. And they put it on the boat, and they think they have to let it off at the end of the day. And so they let the pressure off of the hydraulic backstay adjuster, the backstay goes slack, the force that comes with attention takes the mast head forwards. And therefore, this, this, this situation here can just be easily taken out either by more backstay attention or less force to attention and more backstay, but it needs to be straightened up. And we find a lot of people putting hydraulic backstay tensions on laterally will do that. They'll leave the, they'll just let the pressure right off, the, the backstay goes slack, the force they go slack, and you can have a situation here when it inverts. When, especially when you put power into the headsail, headsail powers up, it's tension, it's tension on the force that takes the mast head forwards. So, so be aware of that. I, mean, I couldn't find a contest with badly set up as that. Um, but they force they sag, a lot of sag here, so we go back to the reading. Right, now just to show you back to the attention, this is an old picture I had out of the, this is, this is um, my friend David Hardy uh, did this, oh, it's not a contest again, but it shows how good the back to the adjuster can be, how effective it is. This is without, without the back to the attention on. And that's with it on. Now, that's gonna be probably sort of 50, 60 mil of difference. Now, at the bottom of the sail, 50 to 60 mil of, of extra round going to the sail, we'll probably only put 1% of camber into the sail. At the top of the sail, that's going to increase the camber by, by probably 20%, 25%, an enormous amount. So much so that the back, the top of the sail, because the cord's so short, it's, it's going to take all that depth, and the, so what we find then is the telltale start flying, the thing will back up all, you can't actually get the top of the sail to set, or because the force they're sagging more than the sail's designed for. Then you start rolling the sail up and it all goes to rats. So, good, good, good thing. Not, I should be selling you sales rather than back to the adjusters. But <laughs> now, this is. So I think, no, no, don't go need them now. Canyon. How many cruising people use canyons? Good. 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 Really important um, to actually use canyons. It's, it's two, it does two things. You know, obviously, the sail set up, you're up to the black band, you're cruising along. The, the actual front of the sail goes with soft, the wind increases, the flow gets blown back in the sail. You don't want the sail um, flow to go back past 50%, because then the actual lift that's been generated by the airfoil is actually not going to give you any drive forwards. You're totally reliant there on the head saw and the keel. So you want to make sure the flow comes forwards, and to do that, you normally go and wind on the halyard. Now, when you wind the halyard on, you have to let the main sheet off first, and have to let the kicker off first. The cunning, you just have to pull down on its own. Now this has the advantage A, it actually tensions it off, brings the flow further forward in the sail, and also opens the upper leash. So it's, it's doing a lot of things for you with a lot of ease, and therefore I would recommend anyone to, to go that way. I think we're back there, and I've finished. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>